Eleanor is a um, postdoc at University of Liverpool in media studies. Um, and uh, one of the things, just by way of introduction, one of the things that I was interested to sort of observe as I came to MIT, uh, comparative media studies, not as a media scholar, but as a pra practitioner, was all the ways in which the field here, certainly at MIT, was rooted in the work of sort of communications engineers. Um, that, 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 that many of the roots of some of the media studies were in the work actually of engineers. And I particularly think about that in the way that the concept of signal and noise, which is so relevant in our work, sort of had its origins um, in that field. Um, and what's so intriguing about Eleanor's book, to me at least, is the ways in which she, she points out that even as media scholars have tended to getting someone um, anyway, the ways in which um, media scholars have tended to focus on signal on the on signal. Um, and so she's taken a, an interest in her work. She's taking an interesting look at the noise. Um, and the other uh, thing that I'm struck by uh, Eleanor in your in your work is the focus on sound as um, as a metaphor. To, we frequently the ways in which we use metaphors around seeing and you're suggesting that we use more metaphors around sound. So, um, so I'm really intrigued to hear what you, what you have to say. I'm sure everyone else here is too. So with that, I will simply hand the floor over to you. So. Great, so thank you very much, Scott. I'm gonna do the share screening part before we start. Um, So thank you very much uh, for this introduction. And as you said, um, the timing of this book was perfect for the apocalypse. And I had my ugly cry share of, you know, not being able to actually come to Boston. Uh, but thank you so much for giving me this opportunity um, to present to you. And I'm really looking forward to the debate. I have kind of like an hour and a bit more, but I will try to shorten the uh, presentation so uh, that you can have more questions. Um, and I'll just start. So, um, hi everybody. And I'm gonna do uh, a talk about my new book, um, Media Distortions. Um, and you can download the book, it's open access, and you even have a playlist with dark motives uh, and things like that. And you can see things that didn't come into the book. Um, so please go into that website. Um, a bit about me, uh, I like to go to Comic-Con as you see here. Uh, I thought that it would be suitable to show you um, how I always uh, think about different kind of bots and different kind of deviant things. Um, I'm a researcher, activist, feminist, uh, and currently I'm working on several projects which sort of continue what I'm gonna talk about today around data literacies. Um, I'm gonna talk about that a bit more towards the end of the, of the talk. Um, but I also wanna talk about my background. Uh, I used to be a radio broadcaster of a psychedelic trance. I used to edit television channels. I used to be a journalist of electronic dance music culture uh, and write about that. Um, and I wrote a book. My previous book was about the Israeli psychedelic trance culture. So for me, sound has always been a way to think and examine things through. So I think this is quite important into sort of the introduction of um, this book, origin story, if you may. Um, so why focus on the deviants, you ask? Um, which is, I think, something that um, for me, I, I always was very attracted to that. So even if you think about the Israeli psychedelic trans culture, that was a culture that was sort of deviant in the Israeli culture. And I was always intrigued in how different kind of things get categorized as deviant. So for me, part of the part of the um, power of examining things that are a bit in the outskirts, a bit uh, called deviant, is to really understand the politics of drawing these kind of boundaries of what is deviant. And by understanding what is the deviant, we can understand what is the norm much better. So we can, in, in my book and, and in my research, I always try to understand who created these kind of categories of what is legitimate and what is illegitimate. Why and with what rationale did they do that? Who does this category serve? And um, how do these categories affect the way that we engage with media and technology? Um, I also question what is a media phenomenon? So when I started my PhD, um, which this book is based on, a lot of people said, oh, but this is, you know, this is marketing or this is advertising or this is computer science. 
And actually people thought, oh, you know, we know what is spam. It's like uh, emails about Viagra and Nigerian princes. And for me, one of the main maybe uh, points to take from my book is to question these kind of things that we take for granted, whether it is uh, different kind of terms that we think or different kind of definitions of things. Um, and uh, as media scholars, I think it's really important for us to not take for granted what computer scientists tell us that things are, um, but also what you know marketers or advertisers tell us things are. Um, so this was kind of uh, my standpoint. And also, of course, to examine these kind of boring things or these kind of things that are uh, common sense or taken for granted. So in the book, um, I uh, look at, I examine uh, three um, uh, case studies. I'm gonna focus on one today, um, but I encourage you to read the book and you'll see all the others. Uh, and what is really important for me is that when we're talking about these kind of deviant media categories, they're, they keep on changing and evolving. So I focus on noise in the early 20th centuries with Bell Telephone as one of the biggest media company of the time and how they sort of structure different kind of territories and people's behavior. Uh, then I focus on spam which is at the sort of the, the end of the 90s and early 2000s. And then I focus on Facebook and how they categorize antisocial behavior. So what is important for me to say is that um, I think some of the problems for us as media scholars is that the sort of the, our media, uh, our research objects keep on changing very fast. And I think one of the things to take from, from these kind of things is the bigger questions, right? Like, we're probably, some of us are doing a, a research on Facebook, which hopefully wouldn't exist in a decade, but what do we actually take from the questions that we wanna ask within Facebook? And this is something that is also very really important for me to, to emphasize that um, media is gonna come and go, but the kind of larger questions of how different kind of categories shape our uh, behavior is something that's really important for me to, to examine. So, in a nutshell, my book is about media power. However, most of the times when we think about media power and most of the sort of the theories that we have around it, and especially when we talk about the internet, uh, but also outside the internet, is, you know, we could take the Michel uh, Foucault's Panopticon, uh, which uses very visual um, concepts about what we can see and what we can see. Uh, and, but also what's really important about the Panopticon is that the architecture has a huge um, uh, element in this kind of media power um, theory. We also have a lot of different kind of terms. When we talk about these things, we talk about vision, invisibility, when we talk about algorithms or AI and different kind of things like that. And of course, let's not forget Frank Squala's uh, uh, book about the black box. And what I sort of, sort of um, realized as I was examining uh, my research. And if you see, I just now, I almost said I saw. So it, it's kind of uh, a crazy how ingrained these kind of visual concepts are uh, in our terminology and how we think and how we explain different kind of things. So when I was writing the book, I had to change different kind of words into sound concepts that made me realize how ingrained it is and how we think and engage with these kind of things. So one of the, so, so these are the kind of things that I, I, I felt that uh, are missing within the visual frameworks, which is when we're talking about these kind of uh, power relations between media companies, uh, we're talking about multiplicities. We're talking about multiple actors, multiple spaces, multiple time, multiple purposes of conducting listening and rhythms, which I'm gonna talk about shortly, uh, and different kind of architectures. So what vision doesn't really allow us is to sort of uh, go between the boundaries of spaces. And usually when I do this kind of talk, I uh, do this kind of experiment where I show that, you know, if I'm going to shout, it's going to pass the walls, but my vision is kind of constrained within time and space. So my, uh, the, the theoretical approach that I developed is uh, influenced by multiple um, uh, other approaches, such as media theory, and we're going to talk about it a bit later, uh, science and technology studies, software studies, feminist technoscience, critical legal studies, and of course, sound studies. And it's really important for me to emphasize that I used grounded theory, which means that I didn't really assume that I, I know all these things in advance. And it's sort of these kind of things came up as I was examining the material that I was um, doing research on. 
So these are the kind of sonic epistemologies, and I'm going to come back to that a bit later. And for the people who are reading my book and maybe noticed, each chapter, each of the, the sort of the case studies is divided. The, the first um, half of the book is dedicated to the sort of the structuring of territories, which is the Ruth media. And then the second part to the process listening. So um, what, I am, what I'm trying to say with these uh, things is that I am uh, taking a different kind of um, approaches and I'm showing how power relations are constructed with these two concepts, which I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, and I'm going to start with the first one, processed listening. Uh, when we're talking about science and technology, most of when we're talking about knowledge production, we usually, we usually hear about um, theories that use uh, vision concepts. However, there are sound um, uh, uh, theories who have been using um, sound as a way to sort of understand and to produce knowledge. So one of the main sort of theories that has been produced was uh, by Alexander Supper and uh, Karin Weisterveld from uh, the Netherlands. And they're talking about different kind of practitioners who produce knowledge. So for example, doctors, when they listen to you with a stethoscope or uh, car mechanics who listen to the car and how they make di different kind of diagnosis in order to understand what's happening with different kind of um, bodies. So they make this kind of classification of different kind of modes of listening and how these kind of practitioners make their assumption and then make uh, different kind of claims whether a body is healthy or is it a uh, malfunction or different kind of things like that. What I noticed when we're talking about the online environment or a mediated environment, these kind of uh, modes of listening are not enough because we uh, engage with different kind of uh, environment. Therefore, um, I uh, developed a new mode of listening, which is called process listening. It is a mode of listening whereby practitioners who can come from different kind of professions and interests uh, listen to different kind of sources. Uh, with different kind of tools in different times in order to produce different kind of knowledges. And by knowledges, I mean different kind of profiles. So for example, uh, when Facebook um, uh, listens to our behavior through different kind of cookies and pixels, they create a different kind of profile on us, and then they can rearrange the platform in different ways to make interventions in our tempo spatial experience. And this is what I mean by Ruth Media. Now, when I was talking about, when I was trying to examine how different kind of uh, media companies uh, shape the way that different kind of information is uh, flowing or not, um, I realized that people use different kind of concepts like flow, data streams, uh, data traffic and channeling. And what I realized is that these concepts don't really explain to you the politics behind how different kind of uh, information or different kind of connection uh, is uh, made possible or impossible to us. So I was very influenced by, as I said before, uh, different kind of media theorists, especially Raymond Williams and his uh, concept of plant flow. Um, I was also influenced by feminist techno science, by their notion of process, and of course, Henry Lefebvre, uh, uh, rhythm analysis. And basically what all of the, the combined uh, concepts are saying is that when all of these companies, uh, whether it's Facebook or I'm gonna shortly talk about the online advertising industry, when they listen to you through different kind of instruments in order to create a profile, they then create different kind of architectures that are changing according to that profile. So the way that we engage with platforms uh, have a different kind of ordering uh, rhythm, which is influenced by different kind of political decisions that are usually influenced by advertising logic and obviously um, money. So unlike, for example, if I'm a doctor and I listen to your body in one session and that event has a beginning and an end, when different kind of platforms or, you know, web uh, and, and, on, and online advertisers listen to our behavior, there isn't a beginning or end. So for example, if, if, if Facebook listens to me, it's not like, oh, now I know everything there is to know about Eleanor by uh, the 22nd of October, 2020, and I don't need to listen to her behavior anymore. Because there is an ongoing process of listening to my behavior in order to have a richer profile. And then this profile is then helping these kind of companies to create different kind of architectures that are arranged in a specific way 
to make me engage more or to make me click on a specific ad or to make me maybe um, uh, sort of comment on different kind of inflammatory um, uh, posts and things like that. So with Ruth Media, what I'm trying to say is that it is, it is the way that media companies reorder different kind of components in a way that orchestrates desired rhythm. So they, with this kind of ordering, they decide what is sociality while filtering out problematic rhythms, which they defined as either noise or spam or antisocial behavior. So these kind of practitioners, they conduct the way that mediated architectures change according to the knowledge that they gain from process listening to people's bodies across multiple spaces. Now, if this sounds a bit confusing, then don't worry, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna go into the uh, one of my case studies now. So um, in the end of the 1990s, and, and I just want to say that I, I decided it's really hard, you know, when you write a book and you want to talk about everything and you can't, you know, you don't really know what to decide to focus on. I really wanted to just to focus on the standardization of web metrics, which is the end of the 1990s and the beginning of 2000s, because I think that everything that we experience today around uh, profiling, around fake news, around disinformation and misinformation, and basically the problematic and broken online ecosystem where we are the product started in those times. So I think a lot of the times, you know, people talk only about the last decade, but we're talking about processes that happened probably 20 years and probably even before. But I think it's really important to identify key moments where these kind of things, which is basically the surveillance of our online behavior, have become normalized. So. In this case study, I'm basically uh, looking at how did the standardization of web metrics happen, which means how to measure different kind of behaviors in order to trade them in an efficient way. So as you can see here, uh, the IAB, which is the Interactive Advertising Bureau, uh, wanted to standardize different kind of metrics because in those times, if you remember, um, the internet wasn't really, a, the web wasn't really a, a technology that which was uh, sort of, that people knew that it's going to succeed. So a lot of the time we take for granted that the internet is succeeding, but actually in those times, the, the kind of subscription model didn't quite work. And with the dot-com bubble crash, people didn't really know what to do. And therefore, different kind of com specific companies managed to survive the dot-com bubble crash, including Amazon. And then different kind of platforms started to emerge, which gave a free service, whereas you know, as we all know, it wasn't quite free, but we were the product. So let's see what happened in those days. So with this kind of, um, uh, the, the IAB wanted to actually understand how can we standardize different kind of measuring units? How can we standardize how we measure people's behavior in order to make this kind of product, which is our behavior, as efficient as possible? Because if we are the product, then the kind of the currency needs to be agreed upon with all of the actors that are involved. So as you can see here, these were the most uh, sort of common um, uh, metrics. Um, and what they basically wanted to understand is how are they gonna measure it through different kind of uh, angles? Will, will it be through the ad serving? Will it be through people's computer? And what will actually count as a click? What will count as a total visit? And what will count as an ad impression? Now, for me, one of the most interesting things that was part of this research was uh, to actually analyze different kind of um, internet standards through the IETF, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force. Um, and also I analyzed different kind of legal documents in order to understand how did they actually decide what's happening there. So when I was starting to read the cookie standard, which is what you're uh, looking at here, I started to realize that actually what's happening in the back end is that when you visit the website, uh, you through different kind of default settings, you are being sent a lot of cookies, which could be dozens of cookies, could be hundreds of cookies, in order to basically send different kind of information about your behavior. If it's from the website that you type on, that would be first party cookies. So that means that, you know, if for example, I look at the Guardian, um, then it will be a first party cookie that the Guardian collects information on me. But if it's third party cookies, it could be ad exchanges or different kind of data brokers who are also gonna um, sort of listen to my behavior across different kind of platforms and throughout time. 
So what I basically saw here is that there is a standard and we're actually not really aware of what's happening. What was really interesting with this standard is that the people who suggested it at the beginning said, well, actually, maybe we will show part of the standard will be to show to people what's happening in the back end because people don't really understand that all of these, these things are happening. And the advertising industry at that time said, no, 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 it's going to confuse people. So let's just show them, you know, the, the front end, as computer scientists call it, so that it wouldn't confuse them to see what's happening in the back end. Um, but actually, when we think about cookies, and one of the things that struck me is that all of the people who are talking about cookies, whether it's computer scientists or even media scholars, they call it just a text file. But this just a text file is actually a communication form. Because what cookies actually do is to plant different kind of text files, but every time that you make these kind of, whether I'm reading an article or I'm clicking on things, these kind of things are communicated to different kind of entities. And those can be either, as I said before, the Guardian, if it's first party cookies, or it could be other data brokers or different kind of agencies, which we are not aware of. So this is what I was talking about, sort of um, uh, not going into the common sense or the common way of defining different things. This is one of these moments where I realized that actually, you know, we've been sold that cookies are just a sex file. And this is also part of uh, a legislation um, uh, that's going on behind it. Um, but actually, it's a form of communication because they're communicating different kind of topics, which could be my gender, uh, the kind of device that I'm using, the kind of uh, uh, a broadband that I'm using, and different kind of things throughout time. So one of the other things that the advertising industry uh, wanted to do was because there was all of these kind of uh, robotic uh, behavior, they wanted to understand who is human and who is not human because it was really important for them. If we are the product, it's important to have exact measurements. So what they did was to develop this different kind of me measurements and what they called filtration in order to filter who is human and who is not human in order to make uh, accurate uh, measurements of what is happening so that they can trade us. So as you can see here, they developed different kind of, so for example, the base, basic method, which was a text file of robots. The other one was identification of specific suspicious and non human activity, which was a different kind of list that you were supposed to send to IAB. And another thing was to analyze the rhythms of users' activity, which I found really interesting because what they were basically defining there is what are the kind of behaviors that are can, can be considered as robotic and hence non-human, and what are the kind of behaviors that can be defined as humans? And as you can see here, these are the kind of uh, definitions that they had of uh, what is a robotic behavior. So uh, sort of what did they analyze in order to, to establish that? So they established what users performing multiple sequential activities, users with highest levels of activities, uh, users who acted in consistent interaction attributes and other suspicious activities. So what they were doing with that is basically not only to try to understand and to measure people, but also to define what is a human and non-human behavior. And for me, actually, one of the first times that I realized that was in my first book when I uh, published it. Um, all of the people that I interviewed, I invited them to come to uh, a launch event so that I can interview them. And I sent them all the same message on Facebook because I was frankly a bit lazy and I just changed their name. And after a while, I didn't hear from a lot of them and I was really offended. I was like, I interviewed you. You can at least tell me, you know, yes or no or something. And then one of them who works in the music industry told me, oh, did you send the same format of message? And I was like, yes. And he was like, oh, well, Facebook then will think that you are a bot or a spammer of some kind. And then it will send your message into the other folder, which could be, you know, the spam folder or the junk folder. Um, because they analyzed your behavior, and this is a, you know, a sequential activity, and with the same activity, you maybe just change the name. So that was something that triggered my, my sort of thought of like how these companies 
are making these kind of uh, decisions of which kind of behavior is legitimate and which kind of behavior is illegitimate and then shapes our behavior accordingly. Because what he told me that label manager is that he of course has the same kind of messages. He changes them in a way that will try to avoid this kind of being called the spammer. So this, this was the, the sort of the analyzing the internet uh, standards part. Here I'm showing you how in the European Union, when they were trying to make legislation around the electronic communication that was starting to be more popular at the time, how did they actually define that? And how did the advertising industry who lobbied um, uh, the European Union, how did they manage to bypass that? So what you're looking at now is the spam article uh, from the electronic uh, directive from 2002. And the way that they define it is the use of automated calling and communication system without human intervention um, for the purposes of direct marketing and may only be allowed in respect of subscriber having given their prior consent. If you're European, you probably know about the prior consent. I'm gonna talk about it uh, shortly. But we know that there are a lot of different kind of activities which we consider as part of that. So for example, if you remember the horrible uh, spam attack that we got uh, you two into you two and into our computer without being asked, without our prior consent, and then, you know, when Apple was talking about that, they said, oh, well, actually, with Article 2 of that law, it means that once you have some kind of connection with a company, then that makes it an informed consent. And an informed consent or informed or implicit consent means that uh, if you have any kind of interaction with this company, then you are in a kind of weird relationship where you can... Uh, you, you are allowed to send these people these kind of um, marketing um, things. And during the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, there were a lot of debates of whether you know, cookies should be legitimized and what's happening there. And this is, this is an article that I really like from 2001 on the left-hand side where um, uh, the chairman of the IAB United Kingdom says, Cookies have been branded as spyware tools or some kind of subversive software, but it's what we use every day. And I think it's quite telling that this is 20 years ago where even then people understood that the, you know, cookies and pixels and all these things are basically spyware and doing this kind of uh, surveillance over our everyday activities. Um, but the kind of normalization that it happened uh, throughout the years, I think is, is something that we uh, need to remember that happened with the uh, just kind of the lobbying of the advertising industry that managed to make it seem as if it's, it's nice and friendly, even with the name when you think about cookies. Um, so actually, according to the law, both cookies and spam are the exact same thing because both of them are sent through automated uh, systems. They are meant for direct marketing and they are sent without our prior consent. But it was really important for the advertising industry to make a difference between legitimate um, advertising practices and illegitimate um, advertising practices in order to standardize what was starting to be the online uh, data broker, online ecosystem that we know today. So part of what we understand and we know today is the real-time bidding, which is happening in the back end um, of our screens. And we don't know about it because as I said before, the um, advertising industry lobbied for us not to understand what's happening in the back end. And basically Facebook and a lot of these companies, including Google, they basically took this standard of uh, real-time bidding and developed it into their own different kind of systems. Um, so when I was talking before about these kind of, when I was talking about why should we use sound concepts is exactly these kind of multiplicities of actors who listen to us throughout time. So we have so many companies who are listening to our behavior in the back end. It could be Facebook, it could be Google, it could be Amazon, it could be you know, your, uh, your uh, government, it could be different kind of data brokers that we're not aware of. And these companies are then uh, trading uh, these data without our understanding or consent. So as I said before, this was part of the politics around that is to create these kind of architectures 
where we don't really understand what's happening. And part of the sort of one of the ways that um, uh, the sort of the people who developed the standards said, oh, you know, we're not going to make it visible, but people can still change the cookie setting in somewhere in the setting of the browsers. And this is part of the politics that I'm talking about, arranging the architecture in a way that it will be difficult for us to actually engage in it in a meaningful way. And I thought that it was quite funny because today, when I wanted to uh, post, uh, uh, um, uh, sort of advertise this on my Facebook, um, I used a different kind of browser, and then Facebook asked me if I want to accept all cookies. So if you look on the left-hand side, we have a lot of choice here. We can either accept all, which Facebook obviously wants us to choose because it signals it in blue. And then if you, you want to manage the data settings, you go to the picture in the, in the right side, and as you can see, the only way that I can engage with Facebook is by accepting cookies. There is literally no way for me to decline, to negotiate, to say, maybe I want these cookies, maybe I don't want those cookies. And for me, this is, this is part of what, what I'm trying to say with my book is how these kind of companies structure specific architecture where we basically have one way to experience them. And Facebook, of course, is not the only one. We also have uh, Google uh, and Amazon and all of these companies. But I think it's really important for us to understand that we are presented with one way of experiencing them. And, uh, and then we don't see what actually happening in the back end. So what you're seeing here, some of these um, devices do not exist anymore. The light bleam, which was connected uh, to Firefox in the middle. Um, on the left, you see Privacy Badger. And on the right is the UK sort of ad blocker. And what I want to show here, I don't know if you managed to see that there are hundreds of cookies that are plugged into my device. And this is, I think for me, one of the most amazing things, one of the most amazing exercises I usually do with my students, of advertising students who don't even realize what is happening in the back end. And once I show them that, I'll, most of them are quite shocked. And I think a lot of them are like, why, why didn't we know this before? And how, how can we do something different? And I think for me, this is, again, part of the bigger politics where our computer screen or our you know, uh, phone screen creates this kind of divide of power relations where in the front end, we get a very kind of pristine architecture and interface where we can engage with these platforms. If you're living in the EU, you might get all of the choice of pressing, I accept, I agree, or okay. But then in the back end, we have a whole other online uh, market that is trading us in milliseconds. And so the, this kind of the boundary of our screen is not only with, uh, with what's happening uh, in terms of, it, it's a division of what is human and what is non-human also, because what's happening in the back end is something that we can't even comprehend. So once we upload a certain web page or Facebook, this, these kind of the trading and the, the bidding on our profiles happens within milliseconds. So our screen creates uh, this kind of asymmet the, the boundary of the asymmetric power that these kind of big technology companies or the data brokers have of us. So, and this is uh, what happens is that these kind of ads keep on chasing us. Uh, and this is, I really recommend you to see uh, South Park. They had a, a, I think in the 19th season where they were criticizing uh, online ads and sort of how it kind of chases you. And from my research that I'm doing these days where we try to sort of understand people's data literacies, one of the things that we keep on getting from people is that not only do people don't really understand what's happening with their data, a lot of the time when they're expressing these kind of concerns and fears from advertisements is that they keep on seeing the same ads and, it, and in a certain amount of time they say, okay, then after I'm seeing it so many times, I'm going to press that ad just so it would leave me alone. So I think what we're seeing here is these kind of ordering of the architecture and what we kind of can engage with uh, in a specific time and space and how that basically shapes our behavior. And that can also be in the shape of how different kind of companies push us different kind of disinformation and misinformation. So I think only now we start to get this kind of critical debates of how 
Facebook keeps on, you know, pushing different kind of problematic material, but actually pushing problematic material for Facebook is part of their business model because the more emotional material will be on their platform, the more that you will engage. So it doesn't, it's, it doesn't matter for them if it's a picture of your family uh, in an awkward position or if it's disinformation or conspiracy theories because it's all part of fueling more engagement and more comments um, between people. So I'm going to push um, more towards what's happening these days and sort of to show you that today activists um, are pushing and I think that there is this kind of um, reckoning of this kind of power relation and what these companies are doing. We're seeing the FTC wants to start investigating real-time bidding these days. Um, actually, I think last week or, uh, or a week and a half ago, um, activists showed that the whole consent framework is actually flawed of the ad tracking um, industry. Um, so we are starting to see a lot of changes, but the main problem is that the way that we experience the internet today is that these companies want us to feel that this is the only way that we can experience these platforms. That it can only be through, you know, my own profile. That you know, not many people, for example, can use one profile, or that it could only be with cookies, or it can only be through, you know, this kind of uh, ongoing surveillance. And so for me, one of the main things about sort of peeling off these kind of layers of politics and how these companies have lobbied and tried to create these kind of architectures is to show that actually all of these things were strategies that were ongoing by these companies. So that also means that we can also build, you know, different kind of platforms and different kind of things in a different way. But in order to do that, and this is sort of, relates to what I'm working on now is that people actually are not aware of what is happening in the back end. And as I said, this was a, a planned strategy, but people do not understand the political economy of the internet. So they don't know, most people do not know that Google and Facebook are funded by mostly that their main income comes from advertising. Most people don't understand how algorithms, profiling, you know, web cookies, most people don't understand how they work. I can even say further that I'm doing focus groups th this month. And when we ask people, even what is a basic thing like, what is data? What is the thing that, you know, that these companies maybe uh, know about you and things like that? Most of these people have no idea. So I think that in order to, to create a change, in order to understand what is happening, and even more so in order to demand a different kind of future, we actually need to go to the basics and actually explain to people what is happening. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people have seen the social dilemma um, and, you know, keep on uh, texting me and saying, oh, you should see that. Even my mom told me, oh, only now I realize what's really happening, which is good and bad because obviously that documentary could have been um, much better. And I have a whole Twitter rant uh, if you want to see that about that. But um, I think what it actually shows is that the way that we communicate that, whether scholars or journalists or activists, we kind of assume that people know about these things. And a lot of the time we kind of talk from a very sort of top down kind of approach. And I feel that we actually need to go to the basics and actually explain to people what is happening in order for them to demand different kind of platforms and to understand what are the consequences of that. So. I actually wanted to show you part of that, and this is part of, of the research that I'm doing right now, where we ask people um, on the left-hand side, you see how much do you agree that people, that companies would use your personal information to personalize your experience? And you can see here, according to different kinds of groups, more or less they, they don't really agree, but some of them do. But when we actually ask them if they accept that companies would use their personal information to track their behavior over time, you can see here unanimously that most people don't agree with that. And the fact that people don't make these kind of connections that personalization and tracking over time is the same kind of thing is actually a, a clear sort of evidence that shows that people actually have no idea what's happening and they don't make these kind of connections. So when you don't know what's happening, you can't really demand that you will have a different kind of future. 
And while I believe that, you know, as academics, a lot of us are doing really important work uh, in sort of advancing the debate, we actually need to, to go to the basics and to, to make people understand. So um, I'm gonna switch that and I'm gonna, I think, uh, go straight to the end and say that um, deviant media categories are about the struggles to determine what is human, what is normal, and what is social. It is about what makes us as individuals in society. It is about the default settings of our lives. And if we want to change the default settings of our lives, or at least to have several options of default settings, then we need to sort of peel off these kind of um, strategies that were constructed throughout time to make these divisions of what is deviant and what is not deviant. So I think I even managed to finish before time because I was talking really fast. So there you go. I'm gonna stop sharing. Great. Thank you very much, Eleanor. That, that was fascinating. Let's um, see whether right off, whether we have any questions. Um, I don't see a hand. Uh, um, I guess one of the things, I'll start with a question, uh, which is, um, I know some of your work, you looked at sort of practices sort of, um, outside of norms, um, are you seeing media, pra are you seeing communities of um, attempting to sort of circumvent these systems in their media practice um, in any interesting ways? I think that um, a while ago, I saw that um, several uh, teenagers are using the same Instagram account in order to bypass different kind of profiling um, and I know that um, a lot of activists are also doing stuff around that, but I think, um, you know, there's a lot of different kind of people who are trying to um, object in other ways. Uh, so we have Max Schrems, for example, who is an activist who's trying to change things from the legal aspect, which I think is quite important and crucial because, um, you know, you need to have several kind of battles going on at the same time. Um, I think people are also trying to create different kind of alternatives to Facebook and, you know, and Twitter. Um, I don't know how, how effective it is, but I also obviously don't think that there is only one way. If, if we want to change the way that things are, I think that we need to go through multiple directions. So I think, you know, on the one hand, having more sort of different kind of education and data literacy program is one way. Another way is to try and change uh, the legal frameworks that we have today, which are completely not equipped to uh, combat these kind of companies. We, I don't know if you saw a couple of days ago that uh, the F I think FTC is uh, going to have a huge antitrust against Google, which is great, but what is it actually going to do? Um, is it actually tackling the main issue, which is the business model? No, it's just saying, oh, maybe we'll, you know, dissect Google into even smaller pieces. Um, and also, as you can see, um, all of these uh, sort of measurements are coming after a really long time, which these companies already managed to cement themselves as a huge um, and, and inseparable part from our lives. So for me, one of the main things is that actually uh, we, we need to have um, uh, more uh, uh, public spaces uh, which could potentially come from uh, government funding. It could come from maybe have an internet tax or different kind of things like that, where we will have um, other options than the big companies. Um, it's not a perfect solution, like any kind of solution, but you know it could be a start rather than counting on Google or Facebook to to do everything that we need basically today. I hope it answers the question. Is Emily, did you? Um, yeah, yeah. I uh, so I've I have to admit I've only watched I think about half of the social dilemma. Um, but I'm just curious to know if you had the platform of movie making to spread your message, how would you have uh, changed the way the message was to people about these things? So if you could like recreate the social dilemma in your own terms, what would you have wanted to depict? 
I'm happy that you're asking that, Emily, because I'm just planning to actually submit to Netflix. So if Netflix is watching this, I'm open to get all of the funding that you want to give me. Uh, but no, but seriously, I am, I, I thought about that. I think one of the main issue uh, for me in that documentary is, is, is several things. First of all, asking the tech bros to answer the, the problems that the tech bros have created for me is a huge issue. Um, there is, there are a lot of smart people, both in academia, both from, uh, underground, you know, activists have been dealing with these things for, for years who haven't been asked. Um, and another thing is that, um, although I like the U.S. and I think a lot of amazing things are happening in the U.S., these companies are global. So if we keep on, you know, only focusing on the U.S. issue, it sort of recreates the, the problem, right? Because a lot of the, the standards of these companies, when we think about content moderation, a lot of the laws that sort of govern that comes from a U.S. focused and U.S. centered mindset. And I think it's quite important to have different kind of perspective of how these kind of companies shape. I would definitely also focus on uh, Chinese uh, companies uh, and Weibo and different kind of things like that. Um, and also show, uh, I think, more historical perspective. But I think that, um, yeah, I would definitely also not do it a, a, a one film documentary because I think if you're trying to shove so many things in one program that sort of means that you're losing a lot of things so I am thinking of doing uh, a series uh, and um, yeah and just to consult with people who have been dealing with it in different parts of the world and to get a, a richer understanding of how these technologies affect different kind of communities different kind of regions and not to necessarily assume that all of the people who actually created a problem can actually have uh, more insights than people who have been dealing with it in different kind of uh, ways and aspects. Um, that would be my approach. And again, Netflix, if you wanna, I'm available on email and yeah. Thanks, if you need any petitioners for this series, let me know. <laughs> I will. No, I'm serious. I was actually uh, um, DMing a lot of people this week saying, I, I can't stand having all of this, these documentaries and having my mom tell me, oh, did you see the social dilemma? It's so important. I learned so much. And I was like, yes, mom. But so, you know, I think this is part of uh, something that I think that academics need to be we need to communicate more because I think there's a lot of really important and great work that's happening in academia, but a lot of the time it's really difficult for us to communicate it. So I think that we need to have better routes to communicate stuff. You know, a lot of the things that are happening with Facebook, we've been talking about them for a decade, if not even more, right? And everybody keeps on being surprised every time. And actually, um, so that means that basically we need a better communication channel between journalism and way to communicate with you know everyday people in order to, for them to relate with what we're talking about basically other yes vivek thank you um eleanor for a really great talk um that taps into all of my my existing paranoias and 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 you know having been involved i was um, involved in the like web 1.0 really in the 1990s as a HTML coder, right? And so that I know that all these conversations, all these concerns have been there ever since the beginning, right? Yeah. But that they, but that they haven't been, as you're saying about the social dilemma, that, you know, these voices have not been listened to. And the people who are in that film um, knew all of this too. I mean, that, you know, because it was, it was all there. Right. Yeah. Um, but my my question is actually about um, uh, it goes to some of the, the work that you've been doing, um, the interview based research that you've been doing. Um, and you showed us one slide with um, uh, people, whether they are OK with their information being tracked in these different. Yeah. Um, and and I guess, you know, part of what I'm curious about is whether you're also um, approaching those questions in terms of, of trade-off and, and what people are willing to trade off. And I'm thinking about this in terms of the really, um, you know, draconian, um, 
uh, surveillance that that followed 9/11, right? And it and for those who were in the communities being surveilled, it was a horrific moment, and and you know continues to be so because it kind of shifted the way that 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 the state is allowed to surveil different communities. But for a lot of people who are not part of the surveilled communities, it was this question of trade-off. Well, if I'm safer, I don't mind if if I'm being tracked and surveilled because I know that I'm not the person who's being targeted, right? And so actually this is for my own benefit. And so in the case of um, the, the logic of um, the logic that has been sold about cookies and other kinds of tracking devices is that, um, you know, this is for your own good so that we can, um, you know, we can give you, uh, serve to you the kinds of things that you want to see, the kinds of products you want to buy, etc. cetera. Um, and it's just a matter of, you know, you just have to trade off the, a certain amount of privacy for this benefit. And yeah. so I'm just wondering about like how that, um, plays into or has played into the kinds of conversations or interviews that you've done with people? Um, I think it's really interesting what you're saying here. And I had a focus group actually today, and a lot of people said that, you know, that they were concerned about different kind of privacy uh, related issues. But then with, uh, you know, the pandemic happening, they didn't really feel that they have a choice. And I think that the, the non-choice factor here is is quite huge because a lot of services that we have today are digital. There's actually very few services today that you can do non-digitally. So there's actually not really a choice here. You're not really being asked if, if you can or cannot do things. And what a lot of these companies did, they basically changed the nature of this kind of contract with people, right? So you have these kind of different kind of terms of use or different kind of um, uh, contracts basically where they say what are they going to do with your data i'm probably one of the few people who actually read these uh, terms and use when i can not always because i try to have a life and you know that sort of creates um again these kind of asymmetric power relations because what are you actually trading do you actually know what you're trading and i think a lot of the time you know we're being told that we should feel safe or you know that this is okay but actually, it's not only to sell you different kind of data. And we can't, it, it's really difficult to trust these kind of companies because as time goes on, we realize that actually, you know, I thought that I'm giving my data just to get to the Guardian, but actually I give it to the Guardian and I give it to a lot of other data brokers who maybe are then going to sell me a problematic, maybe uh, life insurance or different kind of things like that. Or maybe it can harm different kind of, you know, job opportunities or things that we actually can't really understand and predict right now. Because one of the problems is that this data, as I said, with process listening, one of the main things that I wanted to emphasize with that is that it's an ongoing process. So I actually have no idea who has my data, how much time are they gonna keep it, how are they gonna use it, for how long, and different kind of things like that. So I agree with you that you know if it was in a fair world or in a in in the previous world when we knew that we're making this kind of uh, transaction or kind of uh, way to say okay I'm just gonna uh, give you a bit of my data and then you're gonna do it with that but actually one of the things that I'm 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 trying to argue in the, in the in the book is that there's actually no negotiation here right like you have one way as you saw with Facebook I can only press accept all or I accept. And why actually can't we negotiate? Why can't I negotiate individually with each of the platforms? What do I wanna do? Why can't I have a bar on the side that I can see which kind of data is going on? And believe me that I'm not gonna get confused because I'm sure that all of you at this moment have at least 20 tabs open with like a bazillion other things happening. So I think that, you know, we need to think about these things differently and I agree with you that while some people think that, you know, it's great, I'm going to get personalized, you know, I'm going to get, you know, maybe a gin that I always wanted to, to buy. And occasionally I do get like really good ads, but I, I can't even know what is the, the trade off here because it's so opaque to me. I have no idea what's happening in the back end. I have no idea who who is involved. And that is what's troubling to me and what's troubling to a lot of activists and scholars is that this kind of like 
this kind of a screen that basically separates between me and all of the other companies that can listen to my behavior. So uh, while I do agree with you that sometimes the trade-off is is okay, the the sort of the, all the possibilities that it could be uh, misused or abused is is very high, and so we need to both think about how we're going to regulate these companies, but also how we create a, a fairer kind of trade-off here. Actually, maybe I do want to uh, negotiate with you, just like I wouldn't have an open-ended contract with my landlord who maybe tomorrow decide that they want to crash in my place in the living room. So these are the kind of things that I'm thinking about. I hope it answered. Yeah, want. thanks. And, and I agree with you. Um, uh, my question was more about the you know, how do we change a kind of broad acceptance, uh, you know, uh, among, you know, as part of part of the the activist work? Yeah. Um, you know, how how to change a kind of or, or create a broad consciousness that the trade off is no trade off. I think one of the so, again, it's 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 about data literacies and it's about um about these very basic things. Um, unfortunately, the way that um, media and computers are being taught, we're not really being taught about basic things like the online economy, uh, what are cookies and what are all of these kind of things. And part of the project that I'm working on now, which you saw before, which was the, the, the survey that we conducted and now we're doing focus groups, is to create these, it's called Mean My Big Data, it's Newfield Foundation funded. And part of the things that we're trying to do is to, try to understand how different kind of groups, what do they actually understand? And then how can we design education material that actually is tailored to different kind of people? What we saw with the, the survey at least is that people's data literacies are very much influenced by education and socioeconomic condition. So the more educated you are and the richer you are, the more you know what's happening with your data and the more you know, for example, about privacy settings and what to do there. So again, we're seeing this kind of that how these kind of platforms that this architecture actually harms the people who are the most marginalized. So the answer is data literacies in a nutshell. Um, we have a couple of questions and or comments in the chat, but I could okay. read them, but I'd rather if people- What is the difference the between the chat and the Q&A? Uh, the chat is the, are the, from the panelists and the Q&A is just from the attendees. But okay. um, so I wanted to, and I want to get to all of them, but I wanted to first give people an option rather than having yeah. them out loud. Abby, did you want to make your statement yourself before I read it or uh, what's your preference there? Um, sorry, I have just done an entire day full of Zooms, so I apologize for my video being off. I'm happy to um, read my statement. Also turn it into a, a question, actually, because I sort of wrote it, Eleanor, before you said that you would love to make a documentary for Netflix yourself. So uh, a mini series, a mini series, a mini series, series not, not just documentary. All, I think big. Yes, it's all the rage these days. My my own background is in um, documentary film, oh, um, and think a lot about the politics of exhibition and all of that. So for me, um, what I wrote was um, I'm very uh, I'll rephrase it too. I'm pretty much I'm pretty concerned, honestly, as someone that comes from a film distribution exhibition background um, about the platforms, streaming platforms such as Netflix, that the social dilemma is on. Um, for me, the, the way that these platforms are designed um, are similar to the ways that social media platforms keep viewers engaged. Um, so for me, the fact that a film like The Social Dilemma, which is criticizing the sort of, um, you know, decisions that these social media platforms make to keep viewers uncritically engaged are in fact the same strategies that Netflix itself uses. So if a film or a docu-series, even though I, uh, I do have not seen The Social Dilemma um, because I have major problems with the filmmaker's other work. He uses a lot of, I think, advertising and marketing strategies and his works that are extensive. Anyway, don't need to get into that. So my question is, um, anything that's kind of critical of this type of the results of these types of technological apparatuses, how they, as you describe it, like filter and sort people's behaviors. Um, I guess I'm curious for you to talk about your thoughts of um, 
whether or not anything critical of these things can tr be truly critical if it's being used also as a piece of content by these yeah. very systems. I think, thanks for your question. I think um, uh, it's, it's a really important one and I think it is really difficult to create content that uh, would resonate. I can tell you from my experience, um, I remember one time I was teaching my students cookies and everything. And one day I saw all of my students come and cover the camera, you know, the laptop camera. And I said, yes, finally, everything that I'm teaching them comes through and now they understand. And then I asked them, so why, why did you cover the, the camera? And all of them said, oh, we saw that episode on Black Mirror where, you know, he's, you know, being uh, photographed. And I was like, okay, okay, maybe it's like halfway. But I think things like Black Mirror, things like stories, basically, stories that we can relate to, I think are, and I'm sure as a documentarist, you, you know the value and, and the power of stories. I think that, that could be our way to, um, to communicate these kind of things uh, clearer and hopefully to, to make critique in an engaging and meaningful way for people's everyday life. Because I think sometimes critique um, when we talk about it, um, and when we try to communicate it, it's sometimes, you know, everyday people maybe wouldn't be interested, or they don't really understand how it relates to them. Um, so I think if we can translate a lot of our ideas to, to these kind of stories that people can relate to, that can help um, uh, sort of communicating the critique in, in a meaningful way. I hope that that answered your question. Thank, thanks, Abby. Um, Charlton, would you like to, um, yeah, unmute good and, and ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, Hi. Hey, Eleanor. I'm so glad that you made it to Boston, even if it was only in a little. I know, right? <laughs> Thank um, you so much. Yeah, of course, of course. So uh, this was fascinating here. I was hoping that you would close the circle on the talk by coming back to your use of sound metaphors. Because yes. I find, you know, the argument about you know, uh, having to sort of stabilize what counted as cookies, stabilize what counted as a human user versus not human. That all, that's all very convincing to me, the, the turn to digital literacy uh, for sort of, you know, what do people not know uh, that they don't know? So uh, in that argument, where did your turn to sound help you notice something, make a case that you couldn't have otherwise? Um, I think that because, so thanks for the question. I think when I started the research, I the first case study is with Bell Telephone and it's with actual noise and sound. And so when I was starting the research looking at spam, I was trying to think, okay, spam is this kind of disturbance. And so what's actually happening uh, there? And I was trying to see, so who actually created the first sort of communication model? And that threw me away to Bell. And, um, and I think that sort of uh, helped me to think about the way that the more we listen to different kinds of things, but also the more that we can listen to multiple spaces at the same time, that creates this kind of um, asymmetric power. And so when I'm talking about cookies or when I'm talking about Facebook, Facebook has the most power by being able to listen to my behavior both on the platform and both outside the platform. At the same time, I can't listen to my own body because which body I, I consider to be in my computer, it could be my laptop, it could mean my phone, because of this, as I said before, this kind of screen, which doesn't really allow me to understand who is listening to me. So to me, listening enables us to cross boundaries of time and space. And that means that I can listen to your behavior when you're on Facebook, when you're on Google, and it's an ongoing process. Um, which for me, we don't, we can't really, uh, it can't really happen when we're thinking about it through vision, because vision for me is very much constrained within time and space. Mm -hmm. So I can only be in a specific time and space. And that creates for me a singular layer, if it may. And what I realized with Facebook and all of these kind of, um, companies that are listening to us is these kind of multiplicities of layers. And as as uh, we, as you obviously know, I'm, I work also on content moderation, which we had a very great article that came today uh, on internet policy review, if you wanna see from my, our AOAR panel in 2019. And 
well, there I examined content moderators and how they listen. And so I noticed with the content moderators, which at the time that I was examining it, it, it was kind of sort of new. It was 2015, 2014. When I was starting to engage with that, I was actually seeing, well, actually there's so many different kind of entities, whether it's human or if it's content moderators or non-human like cookies, who are listening to our behavior. Um, and therefore there are these kind of multiple spaces, which I think vision doesn't really allow us to understand these kind of multiplicities. And for me, the multiplicities are important because they show us how so many organizations are involved in creating these kind of profiles. Mm. Um, and again, this doesn't only happen in a digital environment. It also happens, as I show with the bill telephone, in an analog environment. So when I was comparing content moderators to um, telephone operators who also listen on the line and were, you know, part of the communication channel, this is part of, you know, what I was trying to engage with. So I hope it's answered. Yeah, question. yeah. I like that it's somehow, it's sometimes about looking at actual listening practices and sometimes it's a kind of, kind of metaphor that you use to train yourself to notice things. Uh, I think that's, I think both of those are really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think like for me again, it's uh, it's kind of an exercise. I don't, I don't mean that we need to sort of abandon everything that is visual and optic. I just think that there is, there are more and more scholars who are pushing towards uh, thinking about media through different kind of senses. There is David Farisi's amazing book about the archaeology of touch. And so I think that as scholars, and what I really like about this department specifically, as I know there's a lot of artists and people who are thinking critically, I think that it just opens more, you know, spaces for us to think about what, what's actually happening. So it doesn't mean that we need to completely abandon um, vision for all the people who like vision uh, related concepts, but it's just another way to uh, examine different kind of media phenomena. Thanks. Thomas, are you, uh, would you like to? Um, I'm just gonna read what I said, because I don't know, it's easier. Yeah. So I'm following on the idea of distortions. Have you considered the scenario of, of algorithmical listening to bots? So bot, the algorithm listening to bots who have algorithm, algorithmical behavior. So I wonder what happens to that feedback loop and how the global algorithm becomes distorted by the input of algorithms. And I wonder what's the consequences, the spillovers for, for, human use, for human users. So what is the disruption of when algorithms, can so you repeat if, that? I'm wondering if the, so, you know, we have algorithmical listening, right? But we also have algorithmical content production. We talked about bots, we talked about how this algorithms produce content. So I'm, I'm interested in maybe if you consider that feedback loop, right? how the algorithm listens to algorithmical production and what happens in that, that scenario? Um, I think that what's really important for me in my research to emphasize that it's never only machines involved or bots involved. There's always humans in every part of the process. So, you know, even with platforms only, when you think about it, only in the recent years, Facebook has actually confessed that there are content moderators. At the beginning they said, oh, we don't know what you're talking about. And then when, you know, people started to push and more and more people started to talk about that. You realize that there are people at all of the, all of the points of automation. It's never a full automation. There's always humans there. So I think that when you're talking about that, this kind of algorithmic uh, content and also algorithmic ordering, there are always people at different points of the communication channel that are gonna decide what is deviant, so sort of what is relevant for our business model and what is not relevant for our business model and hence will be filtered out. Um, so to me, that is, it's really important and it, it's really important for me not to talk about algorithms in an abstract way because then we're sort of taking away the responsibility of the humans that are always involved in that process and the politics of the different kind of humans, whether they're programmers or the CEOs or if they are the more inferior humans in this process, which are the content moderators, or you know, even in Google, they have you know the rankers who are deciding how things are going to get ranked on the Google search results. So to me, what I think what you're asking involves again with this kind of different kind of decisions made by humans 
and it's never going to be a perfect uh, kind of uh, uh, entanglement. But um, I think that the way that they're going to respond to each other is very much related to these kind of decisions. I hope it answered. Thank you. Uh, we've got two questions from the Q&A, and I'll read them out loud just so that they get into the recording. Um, the first is from Radu. And, and, um, the idea of surveillance and data capitalism that is being put forward by the tech giants nowadays drives me to always think of Gramsci and his theory of hegemony. Following Gramsci's strategies of changing the systems, he advocated of, of people going into institutions such as schools, government offices, to change them from within. Would that be possible in the tech industry? Or would those change makers be immediately perceived as deviant and thrown away? And then. Uh, adds, I'm sorry, a long question, but I'd love this talk and got very enthusiastic, so. No, it's fantastic. Please, please ask, and it's great. I, I really like the questions here. It's, it's uh, great that people engage with the, the, the book. Um, so you're basically asking if it's the matrix and if Neo needs to be part of the system or not. Um, I think that, again, in order to change the way that things are, I think that we need to think about it um, not as like the one solution, but as multiple solutions. And of course, different kind of solutions are going to be uh, more relevant in different kind of regions. So what will be more beneficial in Europe is not going to be more beneficial in the US or Russia or Asia, uh, China, Israel, different kind of places. Um, I do think that a lot of people are trying to change uh, both from within and outside. Um, I think that we need to have these kind of forces in all of the directions. Um, I think that at the moment, the kind of instruments that we have, as I said before, you know, everybody had so many hopes with the GDPR. Um, if you are following, and I really recommend you to follow Max Schrems, who's an activist who's been trying to change a lot of things, uh, and he has changed a lot of things. Um, what he showed is that even though we have the GDPR, the kind of the DPA, the, the data protection authority in different kind of countries in Europe actually provide very little money to actually take care of all of the people's um, sort of uh, lawsuits against different kind of companies that are dealing with their data. So um, I do think that people need to integrate both in government, hopefully also in, in uh, um, technology companies, but also that we need to uh, educate people. So to me, it's it's multi-layered, both to, to, to change laws, to have data literacies, to change the way the technology companies are operating, um, and also to change the way that we are talking about these things, whether it's with, uh, you know, more entertaining content, but also journalists. Um, so um, yeah, it's a multi-year, multi multi-step strategy. And, uh, to some degree, with that answer, you may have answered the, the following question, but uh, this is from Hamid Reza and Nasiri. What you said about social dilemma, isn't that actually one of the main issues? That there are these sources that give the illusion of informing people, but they systematically ignore the systemic problems that make sure that the discourse remains shaped by the powerful institutions. The same thing that Professor Bald mentioned regarding convincing people that it's for their own security or recently convincing people that censorship by the big by big tech is actually in the interest of the people. How can one fight that kind of informing that persuades people to act against their own interests while making them think that they're actually engaging in resistance? Very intense questions. Um, I, again, I don't have uh, all the solutions. I only think that the way to make people engage is actually to inform them. And I think that people only um, I have a friend who's been an activist for many years, and he told me that the things that sort of motivates people to go to the streets is when things hit you the most. So in Israel at the moment, people are demonstrating for the past few months against Benjamin Netanyahu and his regime. And it's not that they haven't been demonstrating before, but I think that with the COVID and the pandemic, they realize what they can lose. And I think that this kind of when it touches your life, when you actually know what you can lose, then people are more engaged. I don't know if people saw that um, students here had a whole demonstration against the algorithm. Um, so the story was that 
uh, students who were supposed to sort of graduate the high school year, they were supposed to have an exam, but because of COVID, of course, they couldn't have the exam. And then the government designed the weird kind of algorithm that made a lot of mistakes, which meant that people who came from deprived areas received lower grades than they should have. And then students came and started to protest and said, you know, we're having these different kind of signs, you know, like fuck the algorithm and going to the streets and um, and doing a lot of petitions and like asking and attacking the government. And the government actually caved and changed these results. So why did these students didn't protest, for example, when it was Brexit, which is a question that I was asking quite a lot. And I think that one of the things is that with the algorithm, you can actually see what's happening to you. It was very visible, right? You can actually see how it can harm you. With, with Brexit, we don't even know what is the con what, what are the agreements, right? So I think that if we actually want to engage people, if we want to motivate people to make the make these kind of different kind of changes, we need to help them understand how that can actually harm their everyday life, and that I think engages people into action. Um, and and we have different kind of examples like these. You know, it's funny. I followed that from a distance, and I kept thinking it's great that they're protesting, but shouldn't they be pre protesting the whole system that, to begin with, the one that orders and sorts them? Um, you know, in general, rather than just when it gets it wrong. So, but um, no, totally. Anyway. And also yeah. not only when it comes to their grades, right? Yeah. But again, if you don't really understand how that affects your life, you, I think it's harder to make these kind of different kind of imaginations uh, on people. And, and also people, you know, we show how these kind of algorithms uh, impact different kind of, you know, communities of color, things like that. But not all of the people are, first of all, uh, encounter all of these things. Not everybody care or really understand how that can actually influence you in the future. So, um, yeah, I think I saw another. Yes, yeah, Shrushti had a question, I think. Yeah. Hi, Eleanor. Thank you for that. Hi. That was great. Um, I actually have a question about the assumption that most people have agency over things like public demonstration, right? So I'm talking about spaces and countries where protesting is not an option. You cannot go out on the streets where digitization is the only way for you to actually act in resistance. And that kind of goes back to the question in the Q&A. It's like, if the digital is the only space you can exist to express your freedom, express yourself, then you don't really have much of a choice. And so how do you change your narrative of data literacy away from cultures like the US, the UK, Israel, maybe where you can go out and protest to societies where you just can't do that? I think it's a really good question. And I think that, yeah, we have a lot of assumptions um, in the way that, um, in the kind of solutions that I was talking about as well. And this is why I said that there is no one solution in different kind of regions will have to respond um, in their own way. I do think that, um, you know, there are a lot of demonstrations in, in other regions which are not uh, sort of West-based um, and uh, they are doing it with different kind of means such as memes um, and different kind of ways. Um, I think it's gonna be difficult and I think it, it's, it's uh, I don't really know um, the exact way, but I think that um, different kind of communities have always invented creative ways to uh, object and to protest the way that um, things are happening. Um, and um, they will have to use different kind of tools that are available. I hope that it answered. Yeah, but I think we definitely can't assume that people always have agency um, and obviously um, providing people with data literacies doesn't necessarily mean that all of them are going to go to the streets because if you're poor and if you don't have the time or money to go to the streets then you're not going to do that um, so of course I'm not saying this as you know the one bullet point then you know it's going to free everybody and we're going to burn the streets and you know but I think that um, it is a gradual um, evolution of these things. And just like, you know, feminism and anti-racist, uh, you know, groups 
uh, it's an ongoing process, right? We keep, we need to keep on fighting, and it's not like everybody has the time um, or resources to do that. But I think the more knowledge that we will have of what we can actually do and what kind of power we have when we come together, I think that we can change that. But of course, not everybody will be able to participate in these um, demonstrations. Well, great. Um, it looks like, uh, unless we have another question, it looks like we wrap, we're wrapping up right on time. And so, um, I want to thank you again and thank you for waiting, uh, for hanging in there and, and showing up when you finally could. Um, it was really, really fascinating talk and I'm glad that, that we were able to have it. So um, I want to thank everyone else for who came and uh, we'll look forward thank to seeing you again. Thank you for having me. And uh, again, I just want to remind you that the book is open access. So feel free to check it out and also the playlist um and i'm on twitter so if you feel like continuing the discussion then feel free to either dm me or email me um and it was a real pleasure um doing this event because you had amazing questions that uh, really made me think as well which is quite rare so thank you very much thank you thank thanks, you everybody. thanks